All right, we're going to be doing a tiny home gigantic profits webinar today. And um, just give me a few minutes. We're trying to get everybody set up. Hey guys, we'll start here in a few minutes. Give me about three or four minutes and then we'll get running on this. We'll get started here, guys, pretty soon. <clears throat> You'll be, our guest speaker is logging in right now. A lot to cover today, so glad you guys could all come on in. Hey, Nate, let me know when you can hear me. Hey, good morning. Um, sorry about few, being a few moments late. I had uh, some connectivity issues, but I'm here now. So awesome. thanks for having me. Yeah, for sure. 
thanks for jumping on. Um, we're excited to kind of deep dive into the tiny home world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm excited to talk about it. I've got a little presentation prepared, um, and then I'm obviously here to answer any and all questions. So hope, happy to do that. Um, however, you'd like to, to kind of run this. So. Yeah. yeah, let me. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and then I'll give you access to kind of open up your presentation. But um, let me give you access. Stop screen. There we go. On the bottom there, you should be able to present button. Yeah, I see it. Cool. Okay. Um, so uh, I don't know, being that I haven't used this software before, I'm not sure if I'll be able to see uh, the chat. But if there's any comments or anything like that, um, just feel free to stop me at any point, and then we can we can talk about things. But um, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Um, Okay, can you see my screen here? Not yet. There we add to stage. There we go. Okay, so um, how's that? Can you see the presentation? Yep, we got you. Is it, is it full screen? Yeah, it has us on the side, side, and side, and side, and then we are, we are good to go. Good to go. Sweet. Sounds good. Well, thanks everybody for being here. Uh, my name is Nate Stanley. I'm the founder of Stanley Tiny Homes. Um, we founded our company uh, like four and a half years ago. Um, it was largely in response to the uh, some fires that were going on. And um, we started in my driveway, started building my grandparents a home because their th home was threatened by fires. Just so happened to be on wheels because they were living in an RV at the time, as, as some older folks do. And uh, that turned into a whole thing where I left medical school and began working on tiny homes. Um, we've been the producer of tiny homes for the Portland, uh, the city of Portland, and we produced over 100 sleeping pods for them. And then we've produced a few dozen tiny homes on wheels as well. Um, so our our business is kind of split into two modalities, one that's really focused on um, the housing problem and the other is is custom and spec model tiny homes. Um, yeah, the so the first slide is is I think probably the most important one or the second slide here where we're really talking about like what is a tiny home. Um, most municipalities do not have good definitions or understanding of tiny homes, and when you look at properties and you're thinking about putting a tiny home on those properties, uh, usually the rules will be different and the nomenclature will be different because there's just not a standardized uh, like nomenclature. Like people really haven't um, created that standard yet. So for our purposes in this talk, when we talk about tiny homes, we're specifically talking about tiny homes on wheels. So something that comes on a trailer. All of our homes are built like traditional stick built homes. They, we have licensed electricians and plumbers that do all of our electrical and plumbing. Um, you know, they're, they're built just like a regular home. Um, but some municipalities call them park model RVs. Some municipalities call them tiny homes. And it just kind of, kind of depends. It's a bit of a gray area at the moment until kind of like the, the zoning and stuff catches up with us. Um, and also for our talk, our tiny homes are almost always a complete home. So they have a full kitchen, full bathroom with, um, laundry, and they have, uh, a sleeping area of some sort that differs a little bit depending on the size of the home and, um, just the necessities of, of the specific area. Um, so tiny homes can be a really great <clears throat> uh, like they, they can be really great for a lot of reasons. Um, they are often like the cheapest way to add livable space to your property. Um, and it's a non-permanent way 
to add livable space to your property. Um, so, you know, we can bring in a tiny home in three to six months, which is way less than usual than like a traditional ADU or something along those lines. We can usually do it at about, uh, you know, like a quarter to half the price of a traditional ADU. And then the net gains are similar to that of an ADU because you can rent a tiny house out in the Portland area for between $1,500 and $2,500 a month, depending on the amenities and, and other things. Um, so, and you can put them just about anywhere. If we can't access the backyard or if we can't access the property, we can crane them in. And so there's, there's lots of ways to get them in places. Um, they're, they're cheaper than traditional modalities. And then they're a little nicer too, because our units are, you know, between 200 and 400 square feet. There's, you know, using a nicer flooring or a better cabinet or, you know, countertop or something along those lines. It really, uh, is cheap to do that because it's so much less space. Um, so, you know, you get a really premium product at a reduced price and at one that's mobile. So one, another benefit of tiny homes is if, you know, it doesn't work in your area or if you hate it and you decide or your clients decide, hey, I really actually hate having somebody else living on this property with me, then they just sell it and somebody comes and hooks up to it and buys it and takes it off the property. So it's relatively low risk um, for our uh, homeowners and for our folks that are doing these, that are purchasing these four um, for rentals and, and in lieu of an ADU. Uh, other benefits to using them instead of an ADU specifically are that you don't have construction folks coming to and from your house all the time. The backyard isn't a mess for six months to two years, depending on how things go. And there's, um, there's very little involvement from the city or local municipality. Um, there's also no SDC fees. So we're working with somebody right now who wants to put two of these on his property in the Portland area. And he, his SDC fees are the cost of two tiny homes. So it becomes a pretty easy sale on our part when the, you know, when it just is that big of a, a savings. Um, it also doesn't increase your property taxes because these aren't seen as real property in the Portland area. So there's zero increase to your property taxes. And the um, tax, the, the purchase of the home can actually be written off by uh, either claiming it as a park model RV. And this year you can take 60% off your taxes. Um, if you're a real estate professional, 60% of the cost of the home off your real, real estate taxes. Um, and then take, I think it's 10% a year off after that. Um, or you can claim it as personal property because it is technically a vehicle and you can get 100% off the tiny home in the first year if you have, you know, that much income where you're paying, you know, $100,000 in taxes or something like that, where your tax burden is that much. <clears throat> Any questions so far? Anything that's come up? Just a quick question. Like, do you have to follow HUD standards or kind of how does that fall in terms of the transportation world being a vehicle? Yeah, so that's a great question. And one, so there is no standard for tiny homes right now. And it makes it a very almost dangerous place to be um, just because uh, anybody can build these things in their backyard. And um, so we follow something called the NOAA standard, which uh, they inspect all of our units and they do video inspections. It's totally uh, voluntary on our part. Um, but as the industry becomes more and more standardized, I think it's really important that we follow the things that will eventually be, because eventually they're going to come in and say that, uh, we need to follow some sort of a standard. And what we follow right now is the park model RV standard, which is close to the HUD standard. Um, but it, it went through, it's called ANSI 119.5. And that's what NOAA uses for all of their inspections. So our units in particular are inspected to that standard. We use licensed electricians and plumbers for all of our electrical and plumbing needs. Um, that being said, that isn't true of every tiny home manufacturer, especially um, folks that you may find like on 
you know, Craigslist or other marketplaces. And so it's important to be thinking about those sorts of things if you decide a tiny home is right for you and if you um, look into uh, like purchasing those. So it's kind of the Wild West right now. And I think it's important to make the decision on who builds your home pretty um, in it from an educated position. Uh, does that answer your question? 100%. That was what yeah. I was kind of getting to is like, <laughs> this is a, an emerging market. And I think um, different counties, different municipalities have different ways they look at tiny homes based on building codes and is it a vehicle? Is it not a vehicle? Is it on a permanent foundation? Is it on wheels? And I think that's a question we get a lot as real estate professionals. So thanks for covering that. Yeah. And we have gotten around some of those rules in the past with as far as it being on wheels or not on wheels. Um, and we can build the HUD standards. And I mean, it's just filling out more paperwork on our end. Um, if that's a necessity of the local county. Um, and uh, then if it does need to be tied to a foundation, We've gotten around that by, you know, just pouring two or three piers and then hooking it to the foundation somehow and making it no longer a mobile structure, taking the wheels off, that sorts of thing, those sorts of things. We've been able to get around some of that. And, and our folks are really happy to call local municipalities and really see what the rules are and see ways that we can make it happen. Um, but yeah, it's, it is an emerging market and it's one that the government is slow to catch up to. Um, and so there's there's a lot of really good consideration there. Um, anything else before I move on? I think you're good. Sweet. So tiny homes in general require less maintenance just because they're smaller. Um, and then with that, if you're using them as an Airbnb or a medium term rental, I mean, the cleaning fees are less. All of the, you know, it just takes less money to run them. It takes less uh, energy, water, all of those sorts of things. Um, uh, one thing that isn't mentioned here, uh, but all of our units have traditional flush toilets and we can do composting or incinerating toilets, but we really don't think it's worth the hassle. They have traditional flush toilets and a mini split for heating and cooling. Um, and they're really comfortable and they really do feel like kind of just a, a home. Um, and stepping inside one, I mean, it really feels like you wouldn't need much more space. Um, but yeah, everything that we build is just as a traditional home. It's to HUD standards are better and it's to 119.5 or better. And we, uh, we hope that these things outlive us, The we've, we've shown in our market that our homes are appreciating and they're following the housing market more closely than they are following like a traditional RV or vehicle market. And that's because traditional RVs are built to be taken on the road and they kind of get demolished if you live in them for your full time. And these are really built to be lived in. You know, there's uh, traditional framing, it's not one by twos and, and it's not, you know, plastic paneling. Um, they're also fully custom. So we have, we offer a spec model line that makes things really easy for our folks, but we also have an in-house designer and and a team that's willing to create whatever is best for um, our clients. This build that we're looking at here on the screen is uh, actually a, a um, kind of conference space that's going down to a resort in California um, that's being paired with a sleeping unit. And this space is going to have a big conference table and it's going to be called the Think Tank. Um, and that's why it kind of has a nautical theme and the rusted siding and all that other kind of stuff. And then in, when they have weddings, which it's a wedding venue, it'll also be the drunk tank and they'll be able, there'll be, you know, bunk beds in there where people who can't make it to their, uh, to their tiny home for sleeping can just kind of get thrown in there so that they can sleep. So it's a pretty fun idea and, and we're really open to all of those sorts of things. And we think the custom work is really what gets us out of bed in the morning. Um, but there's a lot of reasons that tiny homes can really be, uh, uh, you know, a good case for a lot of things. They also make great backyard offices and, and salons and like all those other sorts of things without a lot of the fees and at, you know, a fifth of the cost. So, um, uh, yeah, I think that there's quite a few applicable uses, um, specifically for this group. We get contacted by investors all the time that are looking to build 20 to 30 unit villages. And the biggest hurdle for those folks ends up being zoning and getting the 
appropriate zoning as with most projects. Um, but there's, there's good reason that we're getting contacted by tons of people about that. And the reason that we're doing lots of that is it's a really inexpensive way and in, and a, um, great, uh, adjunct to like traditional construction. So, you know, you can buy a tiny house for, if we're doing 10 or 20 of them, you can buy them for less than $100,000. And then if you're renting them out as a short-term or medium-term rental, say that you're getting 250 a night at 70% occupancy, you can pay these things off in like three years, um, which is actually on a future slide, but I'll mention it here. So, you know, I think that there's a lot of great benefit. And then, you know, if you have something where, then it doesn't work out or, you know, a partner falls through or something like that. So you can sell them and people can hook up to them and take them away. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of benefit for folks that are looking at larger villages and the, the market's just pretty hot right now. Um, and so people want to be staying in these things and they want to have a comfortable experience. Um, for real estate professionals, which these, you know, overlap, obviously, but especially within the Portland area, <clears throat> they, these tiny homes really don't require much in sort in, you know, in terms of space, um, within the Portland area in particular, all that's required is that they be put behind the front facade of the house. Um, and so, you know, anywhere behind that front line of the primary structure, um, you can put a tiny home and live in it pretty comfortably. Um, and then you can rent it out as either a medium term or a long term rental. Um, immediately, that offers an incredible benefit to folks that are middle income that want to get into property, but say they're missing 500 bucks from their budget. All of a sudden, they have something in their backyard that produces, you know, 1500 to $2,500 worth of monthly revenue, depending on how they structure it. And, um, you know, for their down payment, and we can we'll talk about financing later, but it can be it can be a problem solver for a lot of folks. Um, Leastwise, that's what we found. Um, zoning. This tends to be kind of like the one of the most important areas to talk about, but also the one that's kind of the most fluffy. We don't really, you know, it's per county and per um, uh, municipality. It kind of just is all over the place. So um, it really takes a discussion with local zoning officials. And usually that discussion um, is more so educating them on what you're actually trying to do with a tiny home and what a tiny home actually is than it is anything else. And we have folks on our team, like I said before, that are happy to, to have those conversations and facilitate those conversations with folks that we already know here locally. Um, and right now within municipal zones, it actually is easier to place a tiny home than a lot of rural zones. Um, that being said, some of that is about risk tolerance. Um, and a lot of, you know, county officials that we've talked to who will talk about risk tolerance and say, well, you can do whatever you want on your property, but, you know, X, Y, or Z could happen. And, and, uh, but we're happy to have those discussions. Um, setbacks so because these things are are vehicles traditional setback rules don't apply and you can place them you know just about anywhere you can back them in and fit so um like this one on the right we're looking at it's pretty close to that fence there um and that one was designed to actually match the house and so it does a great job of matching the house um something else that i i didn't touch on but i will hear because there's an image of it is our units, um, our homes either have a downstairs sleeping area with a bedroom or they have an upstairs sleeping loft. And in the majority of our sleeping lofts, we have what we call our no crawl loft. So you have a full head height walking area with a closet. Um, so you don't have to worry about crawling. Crawling ends up being one of the reasons that people don't stay in tiny homes the most. And um, this is like a really great way to kind of get around that. Um, and this is a unit that's a uh, medium term rental and is doing really well in the Northeast neighborhood. Um, permitting, so within the city of Portland, you don't have to pull any permits to place one of these things on your property. Um, it again, kind of makes things really easy for us. The only permits that need to be pulled 
our trades permits for when we run electrical and, and water and sewer out to the site. Um, but those are minimal and it's not, you don't need to apply for them. There's, there's nothing to do there. And then the city kind of just doesn't even want to hear about it. They don't, you don't have to involve them at all. So, you know, you reduce your permitting time to zero, your design time is however long you want to spend with us designing. And then our build time is like three months. So, um, it makes a, it's, it's a pretty smart decision for a lot of reasons, but um, one of them is just taking advantage of the lack of permitting. And that's not to say, like that is written on the city of Portland's website. So it's not, we're not getting through some sort of loophole. Um, truly, there's just no uh, need for permitting at the moment. Um, and like I was saying, so the only on-site construction that needs to happen is pulling of utilities. And so that is um, pulling electrical and sewer and water off the main house or wherever utilities are. And our contractors come in and just tr pull a trades permit to do that. Um, and it's pretty easy and relatively inexpensive in consideration of all the other things. Um, at this point, are there any more questions? I just have a, just two questions and I think we'll, we'll keep this moving along. But um, I think everybody does their, own, does their own due diligence, right? If it's county or city. Because I think <clears throat> I had shared in the chat Lane County's um, information. The county, in our county, tiny homes are kind of in that two two category system, right? Is it on a permanent foundation? Now it has to file building permits and building code. Or is it on wheels? Does it need to follow HUD standards? And then they try to take it a bit further in terms of does it have a, a fire sprinkler system? And does it have egress? So uh, my question really is, is like, Adapting to those standards, obviously, um, getting the information from the right people is important. But my question to you is like, does your design team work within, hey, this is where we're going to plan to build it. This is what we need for adaption. That's my question. Absolutely. Yeah, that's our primary, our primary focus, because the last thing that we would want is somebody buying something that they then can't use. Um, so we do like a feasibility study where we talk to local officials and we really find out what the local area needs. Cause like you were saying, it changes so much between area to area. Um, and all of our units come with, with egress and, and all of those sorts of things. But if there's a specific need for an area, um, we are more than happy to um, do that. And it's part of our process is, is speaking with the local officials, figuring out what exactly needs to be done and then uh, sending over drawings or, or other things to double check and make sure that what we're doing is gonna be accepted by the local municipality. Um, yeah, it can be pretty difficult to like round everything up because there's so many different folks that are trying to write rules about something that often they don't know about. Um, and so it's, it's part of our job to make sure that what we're producing is usable and functional um, for all of those reasons. Uh, but yeah, that's absolutely something we do. Thank you, Nate. Yeah, anything else? No questions right here on this slide, but uh, I, I own um, some manufactured home parks, right? And we have uh, we have a vacant lot that is part of our our tax lot that me and my business partner were trying to have those conversations regarding installing some tiny homes and increasing you know affordable housing in our area. And I think that's always big a big challenge um, is having the right conversations with the right municipalities to prove like, hey. We're not just trying to fill everywhere with tiny homes and every single inch of the the city, but we're trying to <laughs> we're trying to create affordable housing. And what do we need to do in terms of accomplishing that as real estate develop developers or investors um, to make it a win win for the county and the community? So I just wanted to the put that conversation point into this presentation is that a lot of that starts with us as investors developers people that and having conversations with your local municipalities about what do we need to do to get special use permits or a variance on the zoning like anything that we can do to create affordable housing because here in lane county um we're in kind of a housing crisis we have an urban growth boundary you the only people who can build up are major corporations with big dollars and there is no more land for people to just build allotments after allotments after allotments. But I think this, this part of the presentation is so important in terms of owning 
owning the process from a company standpoint and being like, hey, we're going to help you kind of navigate this before you pull the trigger. And I think that says a lot about your company because we're dealing with this housing shortage down here and probably up there in Portland. So, Oh, definitely. Yeah. And uh, another responsibility of us is to um, we definitely are, are making hay while the sun shines. You know, the city of Portland has relaxed a lot of their rules, but as a company, you know, adhering to um, building standards that are defensible. Um, I think that right now our industry is in a really kind of um, we're in our toddler phase or our adolescent phase, you know, and as we um, continue to grow, it's important that we show like you were talking about local municipalities that we're not trying to build crap, right? Like, excuse my language, but these aren't meant to be just homes that that are built with with zero thought. And these are really constructed to be lived in full time. And there's lots of thought put into every material that we use and showing that this is an industry that can not only um, affect the housing market by producing more housing, but that that housing is safe and reliable and all of those other things that you want that housing to be. Um, and I think right now we're also seeing a bit of a race to the bottom in our in the tiny home market, which is a little defeating because it, it hurts some of that ab ability to be thoughtful in, in the way that we produce our, our homes and other things. And so um, that's like the majority of those two things I think are like probably the most important parts of our jobs, other than just pe treating people with kindness, but also to making sure that, you know, what we produce is, is livable. Um, because we see a lot of, a lot of tiny homes that are built um, by well-meaning people, but they aren't following certain standards and, um, and all of those sorts of things. So, you know, as an industry, we need to take responsibility for that. And then, um, and, you know, just, create the best practices and then follow those best practices. So um, yeah, we're trying to hit it on all fronts and really formalize our industry because I think that it's an amazing opportunity. And uh, what's really big for me and what motivates me to get out of bed in the morning is really um, increasing access to equity for middle-class Americans and or lower-class Americans. So, you know, being, doing like real estate investing or something like that, unless you get involved in a read or something, it's, it's, it can be really hard to break into that market. And what we're trying to create is a way that's approachable and acceptable for like the majority of Americans to be able to like, you know, get real estate income. Um, and not only that, but a, an affordable way for young folk to gain equity that they can then use if they decide to, you know, uh, purchase a big house or something like that. So yeah, there's lots of very exciting things. And it's about, for us, it's just about doing, you know, following best practice and really trying to to formalize the market in a lot of ways. So yeah, hit a lot of the nails on the head with, with uh, those comments. Um, so uh, we have two different processes for our um, tiny homes on wheels. Our, we have our Stanley starters which those are all designed between 20 and 30 feet. Um, the 30 footers have a um, uh, uh, downstairs bedroom with a separate mini split and all of those sorts of things. Great for single level living. Um, we see a lot of our folks that are wanting to move back home with their children who are a little older, um, choosing those units uh, because it's much more affordable than say getting an apartment or renovating a garage. Um, and then they get their own space, you know, in on their children's property or, or things along those lines. Um, so we, we build a lot of those for those folks. Um, we also, uh, and those have, sorry, those have been designed to be kind of like the best bank for your buck and to maximize every kind of square inch. And, and uh, we have three different model lines that, you know, uh, go as small as 20 feet and as large as 30 feet. Our custom homes, so we have in-house designers and other folks. And when we design with people, it truly is custom where they get to choose everything down to the last nail that's that's driven. Um, and the, the process can take as, as short as it needs to take or as long as it needs to take. And uh, our design process is a no commitment design process um, where we, we accept a retainer and then charge it $65 an hour for design. 
And if by the end of it, you decide that you want to design build with somebody else, you can build with somebody else. That's totally fine. You get your design and 3D model and renderings and all that jazz. And then um, if you do decide to, to build with us, we cut that cost, cost in half and absorb it into the admin fees for the, for the home that you end up purchasing. Um, those are our primary two processes. Um, one isn't better than the other. It just depends on what the needs of, of the client specifically is. Um, for our, our, our pricing, our Stanley starters usually start at around 85 and they go up to 150,000 plus depending on you know, the exact finishes that people wanna use. But generally our homes are right around $100,000. That can um, change depending on uh, the number of units that we're building. If we really need to build to maximize um, our, you know, if we need to cost engineer things, we can do that and we can bring that price down um, a little bit. Uh, but with the price of materials and labor anymore, it gets to be pretty hard to go any, any lower. But, um, but we do our best. And then for fully custom, we found, you know, we, we usually start at the same $85,000 mark, but after people get into their homes and really start designing things, we find that it usually comes up closer to that $100,000 mark. And the upper end, you know, we don't reach that terribly often, but when we do, it's because that person really wanted something that was, you know, where money wasn't an issue and they really wanted something super custom. Um, with each of these homes that we purchase or that are purchased, we work with local uh local suppliers who um uh donate materials to us and then we build sleeping pods that are donated to local organizations um like we shine pdx and and a few others and, and so uh yeah we just use our extra time to build those and and donate those which we think is a, an amazing cause to be fighting for um we offer financing um, we partner with a uh, mortgage company 21st century um, who folks may be familiar with uh, they offer 25 and 30 year traditional financing and it's at prime they offer uh, investor financing um, the uh, the length of the note is largely dependent on the amount that is borrowed um, but between 10 and 30 year financing we can lump land land improvements and the home all into one loan. And for somebody that's doing a small village or something like that, we can put up to four homes on one note and then we can run multiple notes if we need to. Um, sorry about that. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a really great, uh, it's really great and it's kind of rare. Um, most manufacturers um, are, are starting to get financing, but it's hard to find traditional 25 and 30 year financing at, at Prime. But there are also access to private and hard money. Um, there are individual lenders like Lightstream and a few others um, who are offering uh, like private loans. And the terms on those just end up being a little uh, less favorable, but they're also an option if somebody wants to go that route. Um, and we have, we have partnerships with those folks as well. Um, any questions about any of this or any, any of the last slides that I've covered? Two questions. One from the last slide. What is the largest, what, okay. So give us, give us some dimension. Like I know you mentioned your, uh, length, but like, what is the largest that you can build to basically make it mobile in terms of getting it from, <laughs> from building site to, uh, at home, right? Sure. Yeah, we can uh, build up to 12 and a half feet wide and up to 45 feet long. Um, we've yet to build that big, um, but we totally can and it's feasible. Um, we're starting to do a lot of 10 foot wide units. Um, most of our units are eight and a half foot wide, which is standard in the tiny home market. Um, but 10 foot units, they, they offer a lot for that increase by two feet in width. And so um, we're building more and more 10 foot wide units. And the, the benefit of building like an eight and a half foot unit is that anybody can tow them and you don't need a CDL. But we usually don't recommend that people be towing these things around all the time anyways. They're, you know, built to be more of a, a livable space than they are meant to be like towed out to the country every weekend. 
And when clients come in and ask about that, we often refer them to, to traditional RV manufacturers, something that's a little bit more aerodynamic and a little less built less like a traditional home. Um, that's not to say that you can't move it often. It's just not built for that. Um, and so we, sorry, the reason that I bring that up is to say that we um, recommend that people hire professional transport um, companies to move these anyways. They have all the right insurance and that kind of stuff. And um, being that you'll hire a professional anyways, there's no reason not to go out to at least 10 feet. Um, anything bigger than 10 feet, you need a special permit and all this other kind of stuff. And so, um, uh, you know, 10 foot is kind of a sweet spot for the width. Um, but we, uh, yeah, so I hope that answers your question. We can build up to 12 and a half feet wide and up to 45 feet long. And then we can also do units that interlock together in really cool and custom ways where if you wanted to create an L shape or if you wanted to have two units that kind of click, click together, we can totally do stuff like that. Got it. Got it. Second comment, second question. I just want to talk about the financing. Um, this is super, super important because uh, you don't know how many calls I get on the manufactured home side, not on real property, meaning it's in a park that people are then the number one hurdle is that they have some cash and they have a good amount of cash. They may have 10, 20, $30,000 wow. down, which in traditional markets, like three and a half percent down FHA loan, right? Or a VA, obviously at 0%. But these, these, the barrier of entry, right, is that the price point is always the problem, right? So I always see that when financing is offered in, in, in the case of your company and these units, right? Now you have a price point that is manageable, but they're not buying a 1976, like, De depleted wear and tear uh, manufacturer home for 85 to 100 grand. They're buying something that's brand new. Capital expenditures are going to be controlled. Repairs are probably going to come up in time just like anything else, but they're being able to insulate themselves for a longer period of time while enacting financing. And I think I just wanted to bring that up is that I thought that was very unique about the tiny home market is that that price point is typically people have to make a pretty big concession on quality of living situation. And I think this is what really is, is a great thing. Um, do you offer tours of current builds or demo models to visually see what might be preferable from Jesus? Absolutely. Yeah, we do shop tours. Our shop is in uh, North Portland, just about as north as you can go. Um, and we have a big 120,000 square foot warehouse that we build in. Um, and anybody's welcome to come up, just shoot us an email and we'll set up a time for you to meet with Megan and she'll walk you through our currently available units. And then if you want to meet and discuss our floor plans or the photos to get together or anything like that, um, we can absolutely have those, those talks as well. Love it. Love it. Um, I think the financing piece, like you said, is super important. I mean, the majority of our buyers are when they are financing, they're getting into a home for like $600 to $800 a month. Um, and it's pretty incredible and it's pretty heartwarming to even be able to see, especially for um, young couples and folks who just don't have the capital to break into the housing market. Much of the reason that, that my family is no longer in poverty, I grew up in poverty, is because we broke into the housing market. And we were able to take advantage of an FHA loan and get a 0% down loan and fill our home full of renters. And um, so it's really a beautiful way to be able to break in and, and you know, change that cycle of poverty is really what's important to me. Uh, may not, you know, be important to all investors, but it's important to me and it's, it's part of our virtues um, as a company. Um, and, and not only that, but we are launching a program, which is the first that I've talked about it publicly. Um, uh, but we're launching a program where we are offering uh, property management as well. Um, with the idea that we're going to be increasing the, uh, the net income of middle-class Americans and what we're planning to do and what we're putting in place is we are going to be offering a zero, zero input rental. So you give us a parcel on your property or not a parcel, but you give us an area on your property. We'll build your home. We'll furnish your home. We'll manage the rental. We'll build a fence. You'll, you'll never even see it. 
and we'll write you a check for the difference every month. Um, and that difference, you know, is likely to be between $800 to $1,000 a month. And uh, not only that, but then they have equity and they have, you know, a, a second home where if something were to happen, they have some place that they could go, they could stop using it as a rental. And um, we're really excited about that program and we're getting that program off the ground. Uh, the caveat is that the financing would be in their name, but we would make the financing payments for them. And then we would just write them the difference every month for, you know, what we bring in for rent versus what their their monthly payment was. Um, and it's really to. meant to just be an approachable and, and easy way to access a lot of things that are often held behind uh, and not restricted for, but usually the only people that can access that sort of income are real estate professionals, are people that are in the industry. Um, and so it's the hope is that it gets more people into that income stream. No, uh, I am. <laughs> this is amazing that you're talking about this now because the components of why people don't want to. The reason that we have a housing shortage is people. The, the number one objection I see is I do not want to be a landlord. Right. So if you remove the property management aspect and you increase more accessibility to financing, and a plan for implementation and management that eliminates the biggest obstacle that's restricting housing unit production. Basically, that's that's why I see most people who are investing in stocks, bonds, other alternative measures is because they're avoiding property management. They're avoiding the tenant interaction. They're avoiding being on call 24 seven to any problems that come up. And I think by you guys addressing that, it is going to be a game changer yeah and so um that's kind of our secret sauce right now and i think that it really for us it's a great sales pitch right and that's all that it is for us we will charge for our property management but it'll be at like a 10 to 15 percent rate it'll just cover that person's salary you know and as we get more and more homes underneath our property management guys you know that 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 percentage will become less and less to, to pay for that individual or that um, sector of our company. Um, and then for us, it's a benefit because it's just, you know, it's, it makes sales easier. And then as a company, we have, we have kind of three virtues and values and those are, you know, building the best relationships, building the best product and building a better world. And uh, it really, for us, just helps us to feel good about building a better world. Um, and in spaces like Portland and Eugene, where you have these urban growth boundaries and the only people that can afford to be making, um, real estate income are the people that can afford to be building up or, you know, giving up some of your livable space and building a downstairs basement ADU or building a garage ADU, you know, we want to be the alternative to that. And we want to make it as zero hassle as possible, where if you don't want to see your renters, we put up a ton of our provider. They have their own separate entrance and you never see them. And um, then if in five or 10 years, you decide that you hate the game and you don't want to do it anymore, you sell it. And, you know, either through us or through somebody else, we come and hook up to it and we sell it for you or somebody else sells it for you or you sell it yourself. Um, and then it's kind of a zero, you know, you, you're, you're out what you're in and, and um, the, one of the cool things about our financing is our financing partner um, has relatively low down payments. And for somebody who's uh, doing something like that, down payments can be, you know, as low as five to 10%. It's a little higher than traditional, uh, like the traditional housing market. But when you talk about the actual numbers, it's not that much more. Um, and it's not, I mean, it's a lot less generally, sorry. And, um, for somebody, there are areas where you can build these things to HUD standards and live in them full time on bare land. They can do bare land loans with improvements with the home at 0% down with the right credit score. Um, I think it's above a 700. I can't remember. I'd have to look at my documents. But yeah, 0% down, you get bare land, which is, I mean, we all know how hard that is to find bare land at 0%. And then you also get all of the improvements, bringing utilities, all of those sorts of things, putting in septic and a home. And it can, yeah, all be done at 0%, which I think is pretty incredible. Um, but those are kind of our, our the next iteration of the things that we're 
um, getting off the ground. Uh, before I move on, anything about that that we'd like to talk about a little bit more? Okay, well, I'll continue. So um, this is our second to last slide. This is just a general question and answers, kind of common question and answers. So if somebody has an, an, or, or a tiny home, they can, in the city of Portland, park them in any municipal or residential lot, I mean, any residential lot. Um, and then um, you can always park them in RV parks if worse comes to worse. And it's largely dependent on the local zoning laws and other things about where you can or can't park tiny homes. Um, a big, like I, like I had mentioned before, a big thing about those conversations is really making sure that we um, speak to the officials directly and educate them on what we're doing as far as what a tiny home actually is. And then um, learning to not take no when no isn't really the answer, when it's like, okay, if we tie this thing down, then can we park it there? If we you know, uh, give you the HUD standard uh, paperwork, then can we park it there? You know, what is really required of us to be able to park it where we want to park it? Um, so uh, the the next one is like, can I put one on my property? And again, that's like a zo local zoning question. And, and our team is very happy and welcome to, to facilitate those conversations and have those conversations on your behalf. Um, but it, it really depends. And um, it's, again, really about that education piece. Um, insurance can be a hard thing to find in the tiny home market. <clears throat> we have quite a few different folks that we partner with for insurance and a lot of um, insurance agencies will require that homes are either certified by something like NOAA or the RBIA. Um, and so I would highly recommend if you decide to go tiny and you decide to have a builder to make sure that that builder is following something and you get some sort of certification or paperwork out of that. Um, there's a lot of benefits that, that come along with also being certified, but um, I would just highly recommend that um, in, in your tiny home search. Um, again, we just talked about financing, but um, we here offer both private loans and traditional 25 and 30 year mortgages. Um, and, um, it's just a great option for most folks. And, um, another question that we often get is like, why are tiny homes so expensive? And the way that, that we like to lay that out is, um, yes, on a per, per square foot basis, tiny homes are more expensive, but that's because you're taking the most expensive parts of a home and cramming them into 200 to 400 square feet. So in a tiny home, you have something like your bathroom and your kitchen all in 200 to 400 square feet. And you don't have these expansive living rooms, bedrooms, other rooms that are driving the, the price per square foot down. Um, and instead you have still these very expensive rooms that are your kitchen and your bathroom um, without having a lot of that space that drives the square foot price down. So, you know, our square foot prices on our tiny homes are usually around $400 a square foot. That's because we don't have those huge rooms to kind of like offset things. And a lot of money is saved in the fact that there's no permitting necessary. There's no, you know, the opportunity costs, just there's, there's a lot of ways to save money in other ways, but we get that question a lot where it's like, why is the square foot price so high? And so we just kind of like, like to have that conversation up front where it's like, yes, the square foot price is so high, but it's because we are doing the most expensive parts of a, of a home in a small footprint. Um, and I think that's the majority of, of what I had to discuss today. I'm sure there's, there's many, many more things that we could talk about, but I kind of wanted to keep it short and sweet so that we could have tons of time to, to talk and, uh, discuss any questions that came up. Um, is there anything else that, that we'd like to talk about with our time here? Well, we got our first question. <clears throat> Please talk about the repurchase from the manufacturer if they wanted if they wanted to sell in the near future, if they don't like the tenant thing, like what justifies value of the tiny home? Is it a value subject to an appraisal or um, kind of traditional real estate or manufactured like resale ability, if that makes sense? Sorry. Yeah. So, yeah. So I don't think it's like traditional appraisal or any of those sorts of things. There are folks that, that specifically um, 
have created companies around those sorts of things. But largely, it's just like taking a look at the market and listing it kind of like you would a vehicle. Um, the market has continued to, to increase and expand, as have prices and other things. Um, you know, tiny homes that we sold five years ago are worth more now than they were five years ago. Um, but we are completely willing to handle that. Um, the, so for one, the, the individual is completely, um, like they can, they can sell it on their own if they'd like, that's, that's absolutely no issue. And then if they'd like to have us sell it, our commission is 5%. So we charge a 5% commission and, um, that just covers our sales folks. And then they, they sell it for you. And we're happy to either do that from your land, or we're happy to bring it back to our manufacturing facility and sell it from our facility. Um, but that's generally how it works. It's, it's not too much of a formal process. It's more so just a, uh, you know, listing it and selling it kind of process. Uh, awesome. You mentioned rent is anywhere between 1500 to 2500. Can you elaborate a bit more on that? I think, uh, this question is for the Portland market. Yeah. So the majority of tiny homes that we're seeing in the Portland market are being posted on like sites like Furnish Finders and other things. The Portland market in particular has a uh, restriction on being able to use them as uh, short term rentals. That's not to say that people don't use them as short term rentals. It's just not um, legal to do so. Um, uh, but all of that stuff is, is complaint based. And anyway, there's lots of things um, in the Portland market. We're seeing when people post them for medium term rentals. So we're talking furnished finders, month to month, stuff like that. Um, as a furnished rental, they are making between $1,500 and uh, $2,100 $2, a month, depending on the size and quality of the unit. Um, and uh, the people that live in them generally think that that's kind of a bargain. A uh, you know studio apartment in the Portland area at a minimum is going for like $1,500 a month um leastwise from from what i've seen and so you offer somebody a full home with a yard and all these other things in a month-to-month -month basis or or through furnish finders and it's it's you know a pretty sellable product um we uh the 2500 dollars number you're getting more into like resort things and um you're getting more into short-term rental because if you rent it out at you know, 2,500 or 250 a night or $200 a night at a resort or at a uh, wedding venue at 60% occupancy. I mean, I think you're still making three grand a month, um, on that rental. Uh, and you know, like the ones that we just shipped down to California, those will be rented out at 250 a night and, uh, occupancy, I think for him is like 80% or something like that. So, um, you know, that's where the discrepancy comes in there and the sky's, more or less the limit on those sorts of things, but I try and be realistic and tone it down. Um, but he's probably going to pay off his tiny homes in like two years. Uh, and then it's just straight revenue uh, for him. And if you want to do a value analysis, just reach out to me. I'm happy to send like, I have a spreadsheet for short-term rentals. I have a spreadsheet for midterm rentals. I have a spreadsheet for long-term rentals. And I think um, any anytime we can get a ballpark estimate of acquisition price and then market rent, then we can create a gross rent multiplier, um, just a what I call a, a fake cap rate because it's not traded as five plus units. But um, and then a price per square foot is, you know, as we know, is going to be inflated because this is like high end finish, high end quality built <laughs> tiny homes. Right. So you're not if you're looking for something that is like a yurt that is used that you're buying on Craigslist for 10 grand, this is not the, uh, the option. But I, I, there's an economic model for an investor here that I think is very unique, um, especially in the markets that will allow a short term rental. Um, I believe in Bend, there was uh, a short term rental park that had several tiny homes, several airstreams, and had built kind of a community of tiny homes slash airstreams um, with those same type of amenities, a small yard, a fire pit, a barbecue. And I think really it's how creative you are and what the local municipalities are doing and and to create that seasonal or economic market for vacation rentals so yeah. absolutely yeah and we're seeing a ton of benefit from that and, and i just like to to say that i dabble in real estate but you know a lot of my information is mostly self-taught so um <laughs> i apologize if, if at all i err or any of those sorts of things um it's not on not on purpose i promise um 
but uh, yeah, I think, you know, and more and more of that is coming. And if you look at just the economic upside of a lot of this, the there's a, a space on the coast called Tiny Tranquility, and they have half of their units are, are there to stay in and like half of their units are there or half of their area is just a traditional like RV park, but it's all higher end stuff, right? Like a lot of what we do is just a rebranding of the mobile home industry. Like if we are to be like brass tacks about it, this is kind of just like the mobile home industry with like a fancy bow and, and put in a way that is approachable and livable by the majority of, of Americans, or maybe not the majority, but by a large percentage of Americans. Um, but Tiny Tranquility has created an RV park where a number of their units are short-term rentals um, and a number of their units are just the land to park on. And I think the land to park on is anywhere between $800 to $1,200 a month in rent um, just for the land itself, uh, not including you know, buying a tiny home or something like that. So the upside potential of creating something like a park or a village is pretty huge and it's getting, it's becoming more and more, uh, I mean, there's just more and more of them going up. We're contacted all the time by people that are wanting to do that. The biggest hurdles that you, that you come into when trying to do something like that is zoning and, and usage and all of those sorts of things. We've tackled that a few times. And so if there's anything that we can do to help we are happy to help in that regard. Um, a lot of it is just getting conditional use permits and finding the exact right property and, you know, all of these other sorts of things. Um, but it's, it's a really cool opportunity and, and a lot of folks are doing it. Love it. Love it. Um, one thing I just wanted to chat on is flood zones. Um, since these properties can be moved, um, I, th I see a big hurdle with building in flood zones or next to a riverfront. Um, and I think this is for an investment standpoint, I just wanted to bring this up to everybody is if you're thinking about, you know, rejuvenating, we, like in the McKenzie uh, Rivershed, we had the fire, uh, the, the, the fires a couple of years ago and last year as well, but there was a lot of property that was damaged and people decided not to rebuild right and now we have a situation where we have land in a beautiful spot next to a beautiful river with always the question is it is it a fire issue or is it is it a flood issue right and i think with tiny homes it, it provides this element of it's a mobile unit so if there is you know i'm not talking about a flash flood that happens in 12 hours but i'm talking about in the event that a flood does occur you have the ability to remove the house. And I think that is what um, it creates a big opportunity for investors who are trying to set up these tiny home communities and having reduced risk in the longevity of the investment. And I think that's what I get from a lot of these because people want destination investment communities. They want it next to the ocean. They want it in the forest. They want it to places where people want to go for vacation or rent in a midterm, short-term rental scenario. So um, this could be a, a great al alternative to placing permanent structures that are at risk <laughs> of flooding or being in a flood issue. Um, obviously you'd have to check on insurance and local zoning, but I wanna bring that up because I've got that question, not once, but probably 20 times in the last two years up the McKenzie um, regarding, can I place a tiny home for that reason? So. I think that's good information. Does anybody, yeah. go ahead. Sorry, yeah, and I, I apologize. There was something urgent that came up, but um, yeah. absolutely. And and I mean, part of the reason that we started was because of the the fires that happened in the um, San Yam watershed, you know, and um, everything up near Detroit, Oregon, if, if people are familiar. Um, my grandparents were uh, living, like I said, living out of their RV and the, fire threatened them and so many people in that area. And I, you know, grew up going that direction, like Mill City, fishing the San Diego. I love that area. And, you know, just echo your point. It's, it's rather unlikely that the same area burns twice, but if it does, what an asset to have to be able to like take your vacation home and run with it, you know, at the first start of, or at the first sign of a spark or something like that. And we get that question quite often because I, I think a lot of people are thinking about that now and understanding that it's a bit more of a reality, even though it's uh, not ideal, right? So um, 
yeah, I think I think we hit you know a really special place there uh, because of that, and it ties in really closely to why we're doing what we're doing. So totally. Well, let me uh, ask if there's any remaining questions before we end this live stream and uh, thank Nate for coming. Anybody have any questions? Cool. Well, Nate, I just want to say thank you so much. Uh, we do these investor series uh, webinars for no charge just to get information out, uh, put a spotlight on people who are doing the right things, the good things and are just good people. And I think uh, that was part of our initial conversation when we first met was like, hey, like I want to interview people who have the same ethos and DNA that we're trying to create affordable housing. We're trying to build better communities. And I think that says a lot about Stanley Tiny Homes and yourself um, of jumping on this webinar with us. Um, so if anybody has any questions, uh, here's all of Nate's contact information. If you're interested in the financing, any of that stuff, um, please reach out to us. We are here to help. Um, and we're going to be doing these webinars once a month. So stay tuned. You can join us at Investing in Oregon. That is our YouTube channel. We have over 10,000 subscribers. Um, and also you can um, connect with Nate directly or his uh, staff. And yeah, just want to say thank you again, Nate, for spending the Saturday with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is the first time I've done something like this, so super excited about it. Uh, before we go, I'll just show you what we did for the city of Portland's houseless population. If anybody's interested, if you're not, feel no. free to take off. No worries. Um, <laughs> but I will just pull up a few pictures really quick um, because I think that there are some really interesting opportunities within um, uh what would you call it within the investment market to do something similar? Um, so just give me one sec here. Yep. Okay. Can you see my screen here? Let me add it to the presentation. Let's do one second. Add the stage. All right. So when we originally moved back to Portland, we were down in Corvallis and Philomath area for a while. Um, when we originally moved back to Portland, I, I was originally, my family experienced houselessness and housing insecurity in the Portland area. And I was pretty um, unhappy with the way that we were housing or sheltering unhoused folks. Um, and so I approached the city originally offering to donate pods to them uh, because I wanted something that was more dignified and more livable for that population. What we ended up uh, coming to and building for them and they ended up purchasing a bunch for of them for are these, um, these sleeping pods. They're eight by eight units. We can build them any size. They have a, a porch and they're really cute. These are up near St. John's. They're um, right off the cut in St. John's. And they took an, an, um, a otherwise tent village that was housing you know, 60, 70 people and they formalized it and made it into something that I think actually came out really beautiful. And um, there's a shared bathroom, shared kitchen. Um, and there's now these units that are meant to be lived in that are um, hosting, you know, folks and helping them to get out of, you know, a hard time. Each of these units comes with a mini split. It comes with a ton of windows. Um, they're arranged in a way that's really attractive. And I think doing something like this could also be a way to increase a lot of beds for very minimal cost. If there was ever the opportunity to do so, say in Sun River, where you needed you know, a bunch of cabins for skiers or something along those lines where, you know, we can build these units rather inexpensively. And then you have a shared kitchen, shared bathroom, and all of a sudden you've added 60 individual dormitories or something along those lines. So these units in particular were built to be, um, they were built to be identical and they were built to be um, resilient and, you know, to, to not be damaged. And so we use a specific, specific um, wall paneling and all this other kind of stuff, but this could all be changed in order to be much more, you know, inviting, I should say, to maybe a higher end client or something like that. 
Um, but this is what we built. And, and the majority of the reason is just because we think that people should have access to dignified space. This isn't political at all, but just saying that if we're going to be spending the money on something, might as well be nice. Um, and then I think that this is a great opportunity to also say that something like this could be built for a, you know, say Mount Bachelor wanted to do this, you know, it's totally possible and we can build these units really cheaply. And then, you know, all of a sudden you have 60 beds that uh, you can charge 150 bucks a night for or something like that. So um, just wanted to throw that in your ear because it's another idea that, that we've had. Um, but if anybody's interested or if anybody would like to talk more about our pod work, please contact us and let us know. We would love all the constructive criticism. Um, and yeah, like, uh, like you said, we're here for you. So if you need anything, just give us a call, send an email, send a text, any of that jazz. Um, otherwise, uh, thanks for being here. And, and I really appreciated the opportunity to talk. Thank you, Nate. Appreciate everybody jumping on. And this, uh, this, ep this episode will be on YouTube. Um, so you guys can play it back or share it with clients. And, uh, I just want to say thanks again, Nate, really great meeting you again and, uh, have a great weekend, everybody. Not a problem. Good to see you. Take care. Bye. Bye.